Jean Lynn Thompson is a jewelry artist from Rockland, along with her jewelry business, Pika Design. She's also the associate director of the Center for Maine Contemporary Art. Jean has been an organizer for the Mid Coast Pachacucha presentation series and is facilitating today. I'm pleased to call Jean a colleague, and I'm so appreciated that she stepped into this role. And it's, um, Pachacucha has been on a little bit of a hiatus from the Mid Coast, and we're really glad to be able to present it here again today. So thank you, Jean, and thank you, CMCA. Not many of us got to see actual coronavirus 
Instead, we saw this idealized image, which will be on an art history test one day. <laughs> the artist is Elisa Eckert, who is a medical illustrator for the CDC. This image has likely been seen by everyone on Earth and is the ultimate demonstration of going viral. <laughs> Before her coronavirus piece, she was most well known for this incredible <laughs> illustration of antibiotic resistant super gonorrhea. <laughs> Which brings us to the theme that we'll all be petrachooching about together again. <laughs> Vaccinations and gathering in the springtime in Maine. <laughs> the mRNA technology that allows us to gather again is incredible. In the old days, we would have gotten injected with a complete virus. Now we get injected with only a tiny detail, which is enough to create immunity. How appropriate in our current mindscape of collage, AI, social media, phone, computerverse, that a fragment is more than enough information. I'm a full-time ceramic artist with a home studio and gallery. I've been working from home for decades. <laughs> it's a monastic lifestyle, and add a pandemic, and my already quiet life got even quieter. In that quieter, solitary, and concerned space, I kept it going in my studio. I researched and implemented a more colorful glaze palette, and after years of thinking about it, I finally got my glaze designs onto textiles. Also, I wrote songs on the piano about the plague. I made my own masks. I ordered toilet paper from China, which took five months to arrive. <laughs> I challenged myself to find the most obscure books and podcasts I could, and that led me to a series of books about the history of cheese. <laughs> I learned that inventing and perfecting exotic cheese is a common result of living a monastic life. <laughs> Thank you, monks. <laughs> But something else started to happen. Suddenly everyone had time for chatting on the phone, gathering on Zoom, making online collaborative art. My computer was never in my studio, and then it was always in my studio, with people who now made time to really visit. When I posted images of my newest work, more people than ever took the time to show earnest appreciation for my creative energy during a time filled with uh, contraction, confusion, and loss. Everyone getting monastic meant I wasn't alone anymore, which was odd because as many of you in this room know from your own artistic practice, you get good at this creative, contemplative, alone time thing, and now everyone was doing it, and their version was to always be virtually stopping by. <laughs> and I have to admit, it was pretty great. It felt like one big communal studio filled with all my favorite people. I started a romantic relationship during this time. We aligned in so many ways, including what it meant to be safe during COVID. I attended online performances at least a few nights a week that were made by trapped and incredible professional performers, coming up with the most creative solutions to costumes and set design out of their cramped little urban apartments. I changed my gallery hours to appointment only, which meant I could schedule a much smaller window to safely run my gallery. My online sales expanded dramatically and customers chatted with me on the phone with an incredible presence since they had so much time and need for connection. The pandemic freed up my time so much that I got to be on vacation in the summer in Maine for the very first time in my life. And now I understand why everybody comes here. <laughs> Today the pandemic is some version of over and I'm back to some version of normal. Gratefully my relationship has lasted and grown we're both not as free with our time as tending to our work and people has cut into our little adventure island. The online monkiverse has gone mostly quiet as people went back to their workplaces and traveling in person to all the places and people. They simply don't have enough time now, and they're making up for lost time. They're more aware they're running out of time. In a moment, they could all get sent to the monastery again. I'm still here though, and my computer now stays on in my studio, even though the people talking to me now are strangers. They're often inspiring, but my studio, which was either quiet or filled with music for 40 years, is now connected to the internet. And it's strange, especially as advertisers have crammed commercials into every single form of content there is. I answer my phone, it's a commercial. I listen to music, commercials. Streaming videos, books, podcasts, emails, texts, commercials. And I think, 
I've become a monastery with commercials. <laughs> what kind of monastic cheese can possibly be made in this space? By the way, my presentation is brought to you by George Perlman Pottery, located at 1212 <laughs> Open by appointment or chance, visit my website, georgeperlmanpottery.com, for more images of my work and further contact information, or speak to me after this presentation. <laughs> what I really want to say is that I appreciate basic decency, kindness, and creativity more than I ever have before. Uh, hoarding toilet paper and hand sanitizer was just the tip of a really ugly iceberg. There were so many ways opportunism uh, piled on top of our confusion and vulnerability. To you creators of kindness and decency in art in, at, at any time, but especially in a time of constriction and contraction, thank you for all that you offer. Please know you are so appreciated for showing up over and over again when it would be easy to say, what's the point of bringing creativity into this mess? I don't know how we would have made it to be together again if it weren't for all the amazing creative solutions during the time we had to be apart. I've always been a believer in the culture of being saved by art, but really, creativity saved us. One of the main metaphors for ceramic art is that every piece really wants to be a commanding masterpiece while being painfully aware of its own fragility. COVID pointed out we all share the same breath, we're fragile, Yet there's so much strength and inspiration when a bunch of artists gather and breathe together again. Thank you. I had no idea if I could capture it as I 
as a painting, though. It seemed like it took me years just to get up the courage to start it. I finally began one layer at a time. The Mars process took forever. Eagle for the night. This was the scene at the end of a long, hot summer day with no wind and an unrepairable broken engine. <laughs> I just wanted to capture this beautiful moment when we got into the digging and left. I was in Hobson's Bay, Australia, when I walked by this open door with this scene inside of it. I stood there for hours trying to figure out how could I capture all that going on in there? At the end, I just added the red bottom paint boat, or bottom boat paint. Bessie, this cow piece, this makes me happy. <laughs> I was in rural Tasmania while walking on an abandoned railroad track, and I came face to face with this beast. She wasn't so sure about me, but I just loved her. The painting is titled Bessie, which is the nickname of, a best, of one of my best friends. I was in Rome, and I walked into one of those old farmer's market, and the light was shining right onto these long artichokes. And I thought, wow, I've never painted artichokes, but I think I'll try. And I sold it to a guy in New York, and I think he likes having it in his apartment. <laughs> Doorway, La Tourie, France. I went to the south of France to take photographs for a friend's house. In a nearby town, I saw this old doorway. I kept coming back to it, look, looking at it for days, baffled by the composition, and I finally figured out how to draw it. This goat lives at our local creamery. After I did the, after I did the painting, I posted it on Instagram. One of my collectors saw this post and forwarded it to a friend of hers, who said it made her happy. The next week, this friend of hers came by to buy the painting, which made me happy. <laughs> the old treasure. I saw this in a field one day, not really knowing what it was, except, except that it was a piece of old farm equipment. I looked at it for a really long time and decided to paint it. I like how the colors work with the composition, especially the broken part. Misty Maine. It was a very misty morning when I went out for a walk with my coffee. Since it was low tide, I could walk out on the hard mud. When I turned around, this beautiful scene greeted me. It was one of those moments where I watched the mist move across the foggy bay behind the old boathouse. This painting is part of my prayer series, which I began years ago. I was working on this particular painting when I heard that a dealer of mine was in the hospital with COVID. It was a very scary time. I prayed for him for days, and fortunately he recovered and is doing well. I can vividly remember when I came upon this field tune in Oxford. Oh, nope, skip that one. Different, okay. <laughs> I'm attracted to simple things like this, and I'm actually glad I drew this because it's not standing anymore. I can vividly remember when I came upon this field scene in Oxford, Maryland. I think it was the first time. Oh, that got me. Um, it's the first time I ever saw a Willys Jeep. And uh, it, was, it was actually the beginning of, of sort of launching my career. Um, this, I love to hang out in boat yards, especially in the off season when very few people are around. This is a work on paper, which is the study for a larger oil piece. <laughs> I, uh, most of us know how magical the coast of Maine is. This boat was tied up at the dock in Rockland after a thunderstorm. I loved how the light hit it. it. I was in awe of the scene and wasn't sure how to capture it, so I went big. It's about this big. <laughs>
everyone. My name is Elizabeth McCoy. I actually grew up here in Belfast. Growing up, I was always interested in art and design, although at the time I would have said coloring. Fast forward to now, I'm a designer, um, designing products, shoes, t-shirts, graphics, and brands, and I've curated programs and spaces for companies and events. But rather than work on a specific product or with one medium, I prefer to apply my style to whatever the design challenge may be. I'm interested in the way that we design spaces we inhabit and the products we interact with and how those factors inform our daily habits. The approach I take with each new project is to answer the question, how would I interpret this for others to experience it the way I do? And I often turn to collage as a tool which has become a part of my process as a way to organize visual information. I was first introduced to collage at Waterfall Arts in an after school class. And moving around with printed images allowed me to play with reinterpreting the subject as I saw it. Today I use design as a tool for this same translation. My process really starts with being an observationalist of my daily life. Taking pictures and collecting bits of things, nothing needs a profound reason to be saved. Here's a process journal from a trip I took to Germany. There's headphones from the plane that I like because they were yellow, a really, really miniature toothpaste, and a graphic postcard. I consider these items fragments of an idea I want to save. Putting them together helps me make sense of these ideas by seeing the connection between things. This is a mood board constructed of inspiration throughout Italy. In this case, it was the colors and textures really pulling me in. And I wanted to remember these connections in a physical way, one that I could take with me and share with others. Which led me to create this deck of cards for my own photographs throughout Italy. Pictures might be a close-up of some mosaic tiles, a specific sculpture, or an entire landscape scene. The idea here being that these images can be mixed and matched with the rest of the deck to inform ideas or spark something new, kind of like a portable mood board. My time in Italy really informed how I translate something I'm inspired by into something I'm designing. In this case, it was the architecture of Carlo Scarpa. I love how he uses light and negative space and makes his material textures. These spaces, while spare and built of stone, still feel inviting and have a warm undertone to them. At this point in time, I also happened to be designing footwear. The circular openings in Scarpa's buildings led me to think about the window into the construction of a shoe, which I wanted to highlight with this textured metallic strap. Here's also where I began to use collage as a way to sketch ideas because I could highlight the use of material as an integral part of the design. Collage as a way to physically move ideas around the page also intrigues me. I created this approval matrix as part of my research for a project around defining luxury. People were given a sticker sheet of various objects and asked to place them wherever they liked on the graph. The results led me to creating an imagined character that embodied what this new luxury was. I collaged this character with cutouts from fashion magazines. It's on the left. I call this character a diamond head, and I put it on a t-shirt so anyone who wore it could be part of this tribe of diamond heads. The la this launched a collection I called New Luxury, where every piece was a commentary about the practicality of luxury goods. Here, the fur helmet worn on the model was also part of this collection. But more recently, I've created shirts with collages using my own photos rather than found imagery. This collage is a visual compilation of memories from my summer in 2020 in Maine. The absence of people makes this piece a little more transient. It doesn't need to be a specific place and time. It all together and all at once, summer in Maine to Maine. I call this the Vacation Land sweatshirt. I was on a kick of making wearable pieces, hoping that my expression of Vacation Land would be worn kind of like merch. Since the year was 2020, it was kind of this idea of collectively owning our summer vacation. I also like the idea of a giant photographic print on a white shirt, kind of like a large photo may be hung on a white wall. This next shirt is admittedly not a collage, but another t-shirt I wanted to share around this idea of collective memory. It's a drawing based on a true story of a seagull stealing the pizza out of my hand as a kid at Lincoln Hill Beach. And it turns out this hasn't happened to just me. It's a funny story that I thought I just wanted to draw, but my friend put it on a shirt and buy it now at Curator in Rockland. <laughs> Often when I want to tell the story of a brand, I create a mood board as the first step in my design process. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs>
story of a brand, I created mood board as the first step in my design process. Here the brand was about connecting environmental nature and human nature. It's very organic, but it's soft yet strong. These boards showcase the various inspirations for what would become the brand's logo and website graphics. Here's how it turned out in real life. The continuous line drawing of a hand holding a flower encompassing a heart became the logo. The identity nods to the elementary shapes and colors of our childhood. They're recognizable in emotion, but decidedly mature in conclusion. The connection between humans and nature is present throughout as inevitable as in our daily lives. Another piece showcasing environment is this poster I designed for the Maine Wild Wine Fest this year. The organizers noted that they really wanted to highlight the setting of the event, which is this great barn in Freeport, so this is how I interpreted that scene. I wanted to create an image that felt fun and inviting without being too literal, hence the collage. It also had to look good on its front. The cover art and page design for Maine Women Magazine is an example of design prompted by a theme, in this case, legacy, all the women who came before us which led me to think about the layered history between generations for the cover art. I then used the magazine's signature red-orange color to weave a line through the feature articles as a way to connect these stories. But the creative process really comes together for me when designing the setup of a physical space, being able to select the objects that go in it and curating how people interact with it. This collage is partly a mood board of individual pieces for an event, but it also acts to set the mood and showcase a creative direction for the event as a whole. This is how it turned out. And I think the mood from before is really captured by the combination of color and materials. The harmony of form and function was met. For example, the pink vinyl that covers the tables allows the wood grain to show through, but it also provides a protective surface for the tables. At the end of the day, though, as a designer, I'm equally creating for my pleasure along with someone else's. Things have to work well and look good. I never know what I'm going to be inspired by until I see it. For me, if I'm successful, what I end up creating is an expression of how I see things that can be shared with someone else. Thank you. challenges traditional ideas about gender and sexuality and seeks to create a more inclusive and diverse understanding of the natural world. It also recognizes the ways in which the social and environmental issues are interconnected. I began inter uh, investigating queer ecology as a subject matter to center my practice around back in 2019. I spent my first harsh winter in Maine, a season I've since grown to love. Um, <laughs> and I was feeling the lack of sunlight and um, outdoor time. And until then, I had made work um, about my experiences growing up gay. Um, but at this moment, all I could think about was how ecology positively affects us um, and how much we mistreat it as, uh, in return. So that winter, I found myself splitting my practice. I was making works that were um, queer in focus and works that were ecological in focus. Um, so it's a really nice moment of reckoning when I was able to meld the two together and start working with queer ecology as a theme that I was exploring in my work. Um, so the facet of queer ecology that I mainly focus on 
So ways in which we can identify shared experiences with nature, illustrating the yearning to reconnect with the non-human world. And this desire is rooted in the recognition that technology and consumerism have brought humans to a place so distant from the natural world, to the extent that people hardly see themselves as being of nature. Furthermore, society and legislation continuously claim queerness as an unnatural act or a crime against uh, nature as well. So through my work, I aim to offer moments of self-reflection, desire, and awe that can help re-spin the webs tethering queerness to nature in the age of the climate catastrophe. I take inspiration from non-human-centric ecology, drawing from vegetation, creatures, and water, amongst other themes, um, in the natural world. Um, as I create these works, I often ask questions such as, what does the shared experience of being other um, uh, in the heteropatriarchal majority offer as a means of relating queerness with ecology? Can this shared yet different experience create the desire to build empathy and protect the environment? What does it mean to be a pansy, a hardy beloved flower that's typically one of the first to bloom in spring and one of the last to die in autumn? So many of the works have elements of speculative fiction um, that are utilized as a jumping off point uh, for a narrative. I find that these works have a storytelling quality to them um, that invites curiosity from the viewer and offers an accessible entryway point um, to the topics of queer ecology, as literature sometimes surrounding the theory can often feel tense or impenetrable. My works are constructed with a focus on surface texture typically through repetitive actions such as beating, wrapping, adhering. Um, these actions are a way for me to relate these objects to other creatures, be a reference to scales, thorns, seeds. And uh, the result of these repetitive actions yields an intricate sculpture right with exuberance, a word that I feel um, applies well to nature and queerness. And by doing so, I create works inspired by nature that a queer audience may identify with. I interpret nature through the queer lens, meaning strange, odd, and different, while also utilizing tropes of queerness like campiness, sexuality, subversion, and counterculture to create relatable sculptural forms that exist within the context of queer ecology. And the intent is to pave a pathway for queer humans to identify with nature, evoking a stronger desire to protect my work is situated within uh, the tradition of contemplating humans' role in the greater ecology, while also joining a new sector of queer artists, philosophers, and ecolo uh, ecologists who argue we must entirely reconsider our relationship to nature in order to build a more collaborative future uh, between humans and other creatures. As an artist, I see myself as an active participant in this conversation using my work to invite audiences to engage with nature in new and innovative ways. It's my hope that my work can act as a catalyst for dialogue and, for, um, and reflection, inspiring viewers to think deeply about their own relationship with the environment and the non-human world. As we face the ever-increasing climate crisis, it's more important than ever to recognize the interconnectedness between humans and the environment and to work towards a more harmonious, sustainable future for all beings. So that's the end of what I have prepared. Um, but I'm excited to share a little bit about what I'm working towards um, coming up. I don't have any photos, but um, I'm going to have a show at Parsonage Gallery, which is 10 miles up the road, or 10 minutes up the road. And it's exploring ideas of, um, of what it, how we may react to rising oceans um, in the age of the climate crisis. And it imagines a future where land creatures um, spontaneously have to adapt um, to live underwater in the waters that we left millions of years ago. So I'm really sort of excited to explore that theme um, and imagine what that world might look like. So that's going to open uh, July in, at Parsonage Gallery in Searsport. And um, it's been a pleasure sharing some of this information with y'all. Um, and this, as mentioned, is at the CMCA currently, and the closing reception is this Saturday. If you have a moment to come through. So, I believe it's the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
fleeting and random quality of life. Her work is represented at the Walsh Gallery in Rockland, and she's based in Camden. Um, Margaret is an artist who I've absolutely loved from afar for years now. Her works are utterly fascinating on many levels and overwhelmingly filled with joy. Please welcome Margaret. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I studied printmaking. And when I returned home to Maine, the place I'm from, and I've always loved, I didn't have consistent access to a print press, so I moved more towards collage and assemblage. Collage and assemblage were an easy transition for me. I've always been in love with ephemera, postcards, antique games, matchbooks, you name it, anything printed I love. But very specifically, vintage ephemera from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The bold imagery and the rich color saturation of things printed during this time is true perfection to me. I find endless inspiration in this material. I wanted to take this ephemera further and make it layered and sculptural, add depth to these once flat things, and create worlds that the viewer kept coming back to, discovering new layers. So I started creating assemblages with all original vintage ephemera. So there are many things I enjoy about making this work and the subject matter. I like addressing the feminist ideas behind the perfect woman. I love a collage with a beautiful, smiling woman, like we have here. Um, but what's really going on in that brain? The ephemera will be exploding out of her head to create a darkness. I like using repeating elements, using the same thing over and over again. Almost creating brush strokes with the use of a hundred cutout fish or monopoly money. And I'll definitely go through phases of things I'm really drawn to in this material. So all those fish are from old sardine labels. I like the idea of breathing new life into things that would otherwise be for forgotten and hearing people's interpretation of the imagery, hearing the interpretations and humor the viewer gets from the work. And different generations have different things to say about the pieces and relate differently. I want to create new worlds and spaces that these collections of things can live in. Breathing new life into the most beautiful printed matter. Breathing new life into things that might otherwise be overlooked or lost. Giving a fresh look to a discarded cookbook or thrown out farm catalog that have the most beautiful graphics. Um, so um, I wanted to push this material as far as I could. So I decided to assemblage an entire wall at Downing Walsh. I wanted the viewer to walk into the room and be hit with this massive landscape of ephemera. So here I'm in a studio, I'd have a bigger studio um, with the panels. Um, and this is what I did. I created 16 panels that fit together on an entire wall at Downing Walsh and it took me two years. In this piece I can feel, I feel like you can see that um, all the things that are important to this work, feminist ideas, repeating elements, and the beauty and love of ephemera. On the other end of the scale, I created a, a commission piece for AMC Networks, where I had to reference their TV shows. Um, and I made a piece, I made this piece, that they then photographed and printed on metal and constructed into limited edition boxes. Um, and then, and then, so this is what they created. Um, and I loved doing this, one, because it was such a challenge, and two, you open this box into a small, intimate world but there are so many hidden elements that I've created with the collage work. And I think that is so important as an artist to challenge with scale. Do really big pieces and do really small pieces. So there are two sides to the work I create, my assemblage and also my mail art. And I've been sending mail art for over 15 years. And one of the first weeks of graduate school, a professor had each of us define our terms of success in a few sentences. My terms of success were to live in Maine, and make art every day. And I feel fortunate that this is what I've done. And I also really encourage fellow artists to do this and define their terms of success. Um, these are bowling shoes I sent to two different people. So mail art helps with these terms. Um, it allows me to stay connected to a creative community in Maine, but also nationally. And if I ever have a creative block, I always just make a piece of mail. Um, I also love the fan mail aspect of mail art. I send it to people who I think are doing amazing things and can 
contributing to a creative community. I want the spam mail to be a small acknowledgement of what they are doing. Um, and here we have an artichoke head. On to the next. Um, in this slide, we have a baby doll arm that greets the person when they open their mailbox, a kind of high five or handshake. <laughs> and I think in the art world, it's so important to show up for other artists. Go to gallery opens, talks, and support other artists in other way, any way you can. I want this mail art to be another form of support. Um, this is a piece of toast sent to one of my favorite artists. Um, and it's been lacquered and painted. And I sent almost a whole loaf of bread, if you can believe it. Um, and the post lady asked me years ago in a very kind way, why do you send these things? <laughs> and I send them for uh, many reasons, but mostly so people will look at the world differently, slow down, and to remind people to appreciate every day. Um, here's a uh, golden telephone, which I should have blanked out her address, but sent to one of my favorite artists in New York, who I've been sending mail to for 12 years, and I've never gotten a response from her. <laughs> um, and it's just a reminder that sometimes you have to put yourself out there. And I love that aspect of mail art. It's put out into the world and then it lives on. Here's a lasagna noodle sent to Elena Kugler of Turtle Gallery. Another thing I love about mail is that it can be a reflection of time. What place in your life were you when you received this noodle? And would you do that with an email? Probably not. Um, here we have a Barbie car sent to Dallin Walsh. And I like the idea of it rolling into the gallery. The post office people were thrilled, and the people online were totally intrigued by this piece. So not only does the person receiving the mail enjoy it, but also the people around who are experiencing it. So in a screen that's obsessed time, it's really important to slow down, unplug, and show up. I want my work and my mail art to do this. To make people engage with each other, to engage with ephemera, and appreciate, appreciate otherwise overlooked printed matter. Thank you.
at an opening, I asked the director if I could use some of the remnant factory materials in the basement for my artwork. He gave me permission to work downstairs, using whatever I could find, as well as a set of keys to the building. After a few chilly months in the unheated basement, I was offered a residency, which included a studio on the second floor and a shared space with three other working artists. In exchange for the residency, I used textile belts that I found downstairs to create the permanent installation shown here. Many international artists and makers shared this magical building. I learned so much from them <laughs> about creating, ways to live as an artist, and collaboration. For example, I built interesting sets and backdrops for a fashion photographer in exchange for professional photo documentation of my work. This interesting collaboration would continue to weave its way into my art. A choreographer friend commissioned me to build an easy to move set piece made of paper for a dance performance. I found a university library that was discarding outdated law textbooks. I collected hundreds of these books and turned them into a series of mobile paper stacks. In 2014, I started working on my largest project to date. I tapped into my community, community to collect clear thermoform plastic packaging to build a huge sculpture. At the time, my 100 square foot studio wasn't big enough for the task. I was fortunate to receive a well-timed four-month residency at Pioneer Works in Redford, Brooklyn. Over six months, I extracted thousands of plastic packages from the waste stream stitched them together into a 14 foot tall, 16 foot wide plastic tube. The success of this project was an entirely collective effort, from the donated materials to crowdfunding to numerous free workspaces. I then learned to get creative with how I reused the materials from this installation. An opportunity presented itself to collaborate with another dance company, this time to build a suspended set piece for performance about pollution and city waterways. The challenge here was to build resilient components that easily installed in a matter of minutes in between performances. In 2015, I moved to Maine and found a large studio in the Florida Rust Building in Brunswick. This amount of space allowed me, to, allowed me to accept more materials, more material donations from my community than ever before. My work began to reflect this newfound material abundance, as evidenced in the floor-based installation at the CMCA. I then started using monofilament string to suspend the sculptures incorporating negative space and dimension and activating the locations that inhabit. I encourage gallery visitors to interact with the installation and wander in and around the hanging objects. Making large installation work requires a supportive community. On Earth, a piece I made in 2020 wouldn't have happened without the financial support of both the Ellisport Air Foundation and Waterville Creates, as well as in-kind support from Waterford Maine, the management of the Florida Industrial. In the final months, leading up to the exhibition of this piece, I needed a high ceiling space to test and troubleshoot the suspension armature. Fortunately, I was permitted to use an empty space in Fort Andros to put on the finishing touches and document the installation in various ways. The process for making these geometric suspended works requires math, precision, and repetition. These inherent qualities allow me to reuse components and reimagine their designs. Here you see the exact same suspended elements from the previous globe shape piece were rehung in a different arrangement to create this installation at the Parsonage Gallery in Searsport. So, as the artist, I can see a lot of through lines in my career. Some materials, obtained years ago in a basement, resurface often in my work and tell a rich story of creative goose and shared history. These connected threads remind me of how lucky I've been and how community support and engagement are crucial to my work as an artist. Because of the theme of today's conference is Together Again, it felt important to tell my story in a way that reflects the teamwork behind it. My art practice requires community, an approach I did not consciously choose, but one that was born out of necessity while, nav while navigating the challenges of pursuing a creative career. As a result of this, I feel strongly connected to a larger symbiotic ecosystem, an ecosystem that has become my source of inspiration and meaning, allowing me to continue to evolve and grow creatively. This is again another free space in the and Ross that I needed to create to work at CMT. <laughs> Thank you.
charging for the um, bringing James, we probably cannot even comprehend. Um, I hope we can all remember that he coming together. Um, and I also would like to invite everyone to attend our closing reception next Saturday for the biennial. Um, it's free to the public, so we end at 2 o'clock. Not tomorrow, Saturday. Next Saturday, May 6th. Next Saturday, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>